I learned hypnosis especially from Milton Erickson. I met Erickson when I was 19. I was still a student here. Um, but I also worked in the Stanford Hypnosis Lab for five years, and so I've been working in the field for a long time. And it's important to note that we're using hypnosis to create new possibilities. Okay? But there's a lot of ways to be able to do that. When we look into the quantum mind, we see there are no fixed structures. There are no intrinsic, ch unchangeable structures. And so that one of the things that that means is there's no single unconscious mind. Uh, Freud looked into the unconscious mind, and what did he see? Sex, drugs, rock and roll. He says, you want to have sex with your mother. You too. You too. And you want to kill your father. You too. Hey, that's interesting. <laughs> Jung looked into the unconscious. He saw a vast pantheon of archetypal beings. Erickson looked into the unconscious and he saw um, a, a vast repository of experiential learnings. The Buddhists looked into the unconscious and they say, nothing's there. <laughs> but it's sparkling, it's empty but luminescent. So every tradition has so many different versions of this other consciousness. It's important to know that because it's a great example of, of what consciousness at the deeper level is. It, it's a set of potentials. It's a set of possibilities. And depending on how you connect with it, that creates it in a certain way. So this notion of trance is something we use when we hear the words come out of the conscious mind, I don't know. These were Milton Erickson's favorite words. You know, when a, a patient or a student said, I don't know Dr. Erickson, he would get this big smile. He said, I'm so glad that you don't know. Because he knew this was the doorway into new learning. I say I was a young, young man. He was this old guy in the last six years of his life when I studied with him. And the times he said, I don't know, were too, too many to count. People would come from all over and say, Dr. Erickson, just what is possible using hypnosis with this type of problem? I don't know. How about this question? I don't know. We would go <clears throat> after class and compare notes. He doesn't know. He doesn't know. He doesn't know. But he would usually add, but I'm very curious to discover just what is possible for you here today. So we're, we're thinking of trance as a resource when we come to those places on our path where we don't know how to continue in our usual ways. Okay? And then we say, well, there's a, a lot of ways. That's Erickson in the 1950s, by the way. When, if you use the word trance, most people think of it in, in this, what I call the first generation, which is booga, booga, booga. Which is, if you want to have deep experiential learnings, we've got to take a hammer and knock your conscious mind out, because your conscious mind is the enemy of creativity. We've got to knock you out, and then we're going to program solutions into you. You will stop smoking. Say, I don't even smoke. You see, it's working already. <laughs> but this notion of hypnosis as one person taking over another person's mind is unfortunately still the prevailing idea, and it's why I don't use the word hypnosis anymore. I call the work generative trance because hypnosis is a more recent Western traditional way to work with trance, and it is inextricably in both the personal and uh, the uh, professional mind um, associated with one person controlling another. This is the problem, not the solution. So in this traditional idea, the, the conscious mind is an idiot. You need to knock it out with a hammer. 
and the unconscious is an idiot, you have to tell it what to do. Right? Uh, how generative do you think that map is? Erickson had made a radical shift in what I call the second generation, and he began to talk about trance as natural. It's, it, you don't need a hypnotist to go into trance. It's an integral part of the fabric of, of human consciousness. And he talked about the unconscious as deeply, deeply wise and intelligent. Still, however, and his work was developing in the 1940s, 1950s, I came of age in the late 60s where it was a radically different cultural shift. But Erickson had the idea the conscious mind is still an idiot. So rather than taking a hammer to knock out the conscious mind, you would bypass it with indirect suggestion. You would do dissociation. So you'd want to get the conscious mind out of the way and then get the deep wisdom of the unconscious into play. So, and, and he did incredible, incredible work. And the other radical thing was he said, the, the only way you're going to have sustainable change is if the communications are basically in the language of that person's self-identity. You know, what we see, for example, especially in hypnosis, you see in the history of hypnosis is waxing and waning. It gets popular, wow, full body levitation, uh, past lives, this stuff's really amazing. And then usually the changes only last as long as a New Year's resolution. What's the longest New Year's resolution last for you? Ten days? You know, you got the, bought all that exercise program to uh, equipment to exercise and lose weight. And then January 10th, it's gathering dust. So he said that if you develop a solution, but it is, if it's not in the language of that system, what we call a psychological immune system will activate and reject it. Okay, for better or worse, you have an identity. And the only thing that's going to really be sustainable anything new learning is going to be something that integrates and honors the identity that you have built up over many years, in some ways many, many, many generations. So Erickson was amazingly brilliant. Uh, there, there's rarely a day that goes by that I'm, I'm not reminded of, of something that, uh, that he uh, did that contributed immensely to me personally or professionally. But the thing that I've heard so many times that uh, is really uh, unfortunate is I've heard so many patients and students of his say, what I learned from Erickson is that the next time the shit hits the fan, that's a technical diagnostic term, the next time the crisis hits, and I always warn clients, it's always a short distance away, you know, that I will go into trance and I will hear Milton's voice tell me what to do. Really? Is that the best we can do, is have some dead guy's voice? We shut the fuck up? Jesus Christ, I'm trying to concentrate. So Erickson, in a sense, represented a generative conscious mind. You know, he represented this conscious mind that could be in conversation with the unconscious in this mutually respectful way that could blend with it so that out of this reciprocal conversation, uh, you, could, you could give birth to new babies, to, to new creative forms. Okay? So the question remains then, is this thing that Erickson was able to do is it only something that Erickson could do? If so, we're in trouble because he's dead. And the best we could do is wear necklaces of purple wheelchairs around our necks. Is it something, a second possibility, that only highly licensed professionals, that would be me, um, should be allowed to do to talk to the unconscious because one false move and they go on a, a homicidal uh, 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 raving attack? 
Or is it something that each person has the capacity to some significant degree to cultivate within themselves? Generative trance, the work that um, I've been developing, really talks about that. So our client in the generative trance is not the unconscious, but it's really this relationship or this conversation between the cognitive verbal social self, which is the manager and the avatar for who you are in the world, and then this deep dreamer creative um, uh, um, consciousness that's connected to everything and, and has infinite possibilities. This is, of course, if, if you really did any modeling of creative performers, you would not hear in any creative performers, I just do it from my unconscious. Well, you, what you would model from any creative performer is what is the nature of that conversation that they have um, cultivated and they practice regularly so that they get the best of both worlds and they're able to do the generative work. So that's what we're thinking of. And so your job as the practitioner is not to hypnotize them or put them into a trance, but to be able to invite this conversation around whatever intention that they have. To be able to have this sense that the person wants something, and I'm, I'm looking to create positive conditions to allow them to, to creatively achieve their goal in some sustainable way. And so we realize you've got to have both of these minds, the elevators have to be going up and down.